Good evening. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to all my students and faculty. Welcome to all our guests. My name is Mark Tribe. I'm the chair of the Graduate Fine Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts. It's such a pleasure to introduce this event organized by Larry Ose Mensa of Art Noir. I first met Larry, maybe it was last summer, early fall, last summer, at Noya House, which is a kind of co-working space, um, where he organized this wonderful conversation uh, between Toyin Oji Odotola and uh, Yar Jesse, who's a novelist who wrote um, Homegoing. Uh, Toyin is an artist, and uh, it was a wonderful event. I was really struck by Art Noir's ability to gather a really eclectic and diverse audience to hear a conversation that was just felt really real and uh, and authentic. It didn't seem like the the two conversants were just sort of showing up and giving their usual rap, but they were really having a conversation that was a privilege to uh, witness and, and participate in. Art Noir is a, a collective, an international collective of culturalists who create events and experiences that cross boundaries of disciplines that are uh, intercultural and, uh, in my experience, always interesting. Uh, so uh, thank you, Larry, for working with us. And would you like to introduce you, man? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Allison. I want to thank the students, Joan, Jason, David. Um, this has been many months in the making, many emails and conversations with Jason. Um, I saw Jason perform last summer at his gallery, Lorraine Augustine, and I was just struck by how him and his band came together, and it had me thinking about this idea of collaborative process and the importance of collaboration um, not only to individual practice, but to collective practice. And having spent time here, um, I felt like that was something important to bring to SBA. As someone who's done grad school before, I think sometimes students don't take advantage of the cohort and the classmates and the environment that you're in. And so I thought it was important to bring two masters at their craft uh, to share their experiences with you. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for our, your patience through our technical challenges, uh, but we're in for a really great conversation, so I will turn it to Joan and Jason and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. So, yeah, you begin, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Joan and I met, what, 2005? I might, I might say that I'm a I'm a, um, a jazz musician, I play piano, this is my job. I travel the world playing concerts, all around the world playing piano. I'm a jazz musician through and through from Houston, Texas, that's just what I do. It's really what I do. And then there was a moment where all of that changed because I came up to New York to go to Manhattan School of Music and study jazz and study jazz history in a jazz city. Just like you hear trying to study art in an art city. You know, you come here and you think you're gonna figure it out because this is where people do it. But what I wasn't getting any answers to was why were people doing it? Rather than just we were playing our instruments and learning the solos of other great jazz musicians. So there was this tracing that was happening, but never really a why. Why were they playing the way they played? And what were the things that kind of influenced the way or how they played, you know? Or the rooms they played or the audiences they played for? And that kind of all kind of came tumbling down when I met Joan Jonas. <laughs> because Joan started to ask that question, not necessarily to me, but I started to understand in working with her how you would pose that question to your audience and to the people who were gonna be on stage with you. So all of these years where I thought I really understood how to make records, how to play a show for an hour and 30 or two hours long, but then I didn't really understand like why I was doing it. Even though I had a full-fledged career doing this thing, I really still didn't know why I was supposed to be doing it. And, um, and so maybe, Joan, maybe we could, I mean, but so that's kind of the thing I'll start from and now I'll pass it to Joan. Well, thank you. Jason, you're, uh, Jason's amazing. And um, I'll just start 
Is this working, this microphone? Yeah. I'll just start by saying um, I've worked with composers before, but the big difference between everybody was great, but I've never worked with a composer for such a long And I would say that Jason is a composer, he, a jazz musician, but also a composer. And so I've worked with Jason longer than I've worked, ever worked with any other uh, composer. Now it's been since 2005. How many years is that? Long. <laughs> Anyway, but um, so I'll just say, so things shifted for me too when I met Jason, and I'll just tell you the story of how we did meet because I think Larry asked about that, and um, it was it was in 2005. I was looking for somebody. I was commissioned by Dia Beacon to do a, to do a piece, and I was looking for a composer, and I wanted to find somebody I didn't know, a little outside of my immediate circle. And um, Adam Pendleton was a friend of mine showing in the same gallery. And I said to him, yeah, this is my dilemma. And he said, well, I've been listening to this uh, interesting musician composer, and maybe we should, you should look into him, Jason Moran. And so I looked in the newspaper that very day, and there he was. He was going to play at Lincoln Center that night. And so we all went, um, Adam, myself, and the gallery people. And I, li and I liked it, you know. How did I find Jason? How did I decide I wanted to work with him? Um, I, I really loved what I heard. And I was very interested in, in the way, what was the name of that piece? It was called Rain. Yeah, it was a beautiful piece. And you had a musician walking around with a instrument, walking around the stage. What kind of instrument yeah, was that? Yeah, he was that? playing trumpet, right. Yeah, <clears throat> it was a beautiful piece. So, um, and I've never done this before. So I went up, and the next morning, I found his number in the phone book, I think. Yeah, if there used to be phone books. Anyway, I found his number, and I called him. And um, I said, and he answered the phone. I thought, oh, my God. And, um, and then that's the beginning. That's how we met. And I said, would you like to do a piece? Would you like to do the music for this piece I'm working on? Yeah, and, and I think probably the things that I had kind of grown accustomed to were people who uh, might invite me to per perform with them um, in settings that I understood very well. So um, jazz clubs and jazz festivals, inside, outside, concert halls, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, but Joan posed this entirely different environment for me to work in. Um, and I had known about Dia Beacon and, and and there were just enough strange words in our conversation that said that I should probably take her up on this offer. This woman who I don't know who called and found my name in the phone book. And I probably would challenge everybody, not just students, but everyone to probably go that route that they probably didn't think because it would, could possibly change your life. Just as my, I think as much as this relationship has changed mine and the kind of way that I, I work as a pianist. Um, but so in that, so what we ended up doing at Dia Beacon, um, well, was working in this old parking garage. <laughs> yeah. And I've never played piano basically in a parking garage. I don't think any pianist I know has. And I know a lot of pianists, you know? Yeah. And, every, and it was the first time I had to really wake up and write music for that room, which is a parking garage with stone, you know, cement floors and, and, and you know what, how high is that ceiling? Endless echoes. Endless echo, like at least like 15 second echo, you know? So how do you write music that kind of is for a space like this, you know? And we spent an entire summer. Actually, I was very lucky because Jason was very young, like, a little younger than he is now. And so he wasn't as busy. As, now he's really too busy, he couldn't do it. But we went there every day for six weeks. I mean, almost every day for six weeks. And Jason had to play all day, every day for six weeks. And he told me he never played so much in his life, right? It's, it's still true. Yeah. <laughs> it's still true. But, but yeah, yeah. And, but that was also then the testament, the thing that I would learn about Joan, which was, where is your rigor? Like, where does it show up? Like, how much will you dig? Like, will you stop? Most of y'all going to stop really close as soon as somebody tries to poke, and then you see all the gas falls out, then we stop. But there was something, like, Joan came with a new script every other day. She like cross this out, okay, here's a whole new script, let's start. And we're like, oh man, I just was getting accustomed to that one. Well, okay, so you know, the, the process was turning over so quick that I had to produce in a way 
which I was never accustomed to producing either, which was how do you make, make sound for images that you, not quest, you quite possibly don't even understand yet? How, and then how will this all come to stitch together to become a narrative of a performance that would be, what, an hour, 15 minutes? Yeah. I can't something like that. You know, and so Joan, I could probably ask this question about, well, the first question I have, which is the thing you, you taught me about, which, which is about space. And the other one is simply is the, is the other question, which is about time. And then how do you, how do you then string, string narratives along, string histories along, uh, string cultural and, and performance practices along over time when an audience then shows up, you know, and how do you work through those things? Well, um, well, that's another, that's a big question. But anyway, I'll just say that uh, in relation to working with Jason, that summer, um, I would bring in the, I had the, um, the script and the video projections and so on. What I had to work out were the movements. And so what Jason gives me, and it's, it's slowly evolved in a very good way. It was always good but it continues to evolve. Um, his music inspires me. It, you know, I hear his music and then I move. Or I hear his music and I, do, I make a gesture or an action. And, and then there's a back and forth, because then I do that, and then Jason responds to that. Like this summer, when we were, last summer or two summers ago in Venice, we were working on a piece. And everybody went out for lunch. And Jason and I, uh, oh, yeah, I'm gonna stay here and just try to figure this out. We both were saying that. And so I picked up this big oar, and we had a projection. And Jason started playing. And we worked out this section where I had to manipulate this big, huge, heavy Venetian oar. But that's the way it happens, is uh, we inspire each other, which is what happens in this kind of work with um, movement and sound. But it was an amazing summer in Dia. I don't know. That's and so this process has developed so that now, um, before, I think we were separate before. It was like two, two tracks, you know, going side by side. And now there's a big crossover. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Do you agree? Right, I do. Yeah. I do. Because there were then there were parts of what I would take from how we worked then, okay, so then once Joan is not around and I go back to my jazz life, you know, then now what do I do in these spaces now? So there's a club here that's 80 years old called the Village Vanguard that I'd probably ask anybody who's living to go witness what happens in this place called the Village Vanguard on 7th Avenue and between 11th and 10th Street. It's an old jazz club that probably every great jazz musician has played. And every year I go down there and I play um, for a week. Um, it's, it's a rare and amazing landmark of New York City history, just period. And, and so once that we started working together, then I would go back into this room that I had kind of not taken for granted in, as to what the space was. I think I was always like saying to myself, well, what's the content? What am I going to play from the stage? But not then considering what are the walls doing in this room or uh, what are the photographs saying in this room? What is all this visual language that's all around this club? You know, What does any of that have to do with the context that I'm going to now place with my music? Because those things go together. How close the people are sitting to one another, how close they are to the bandstand, you know? That the bandstand is only 11 inches higher than the audience. Um, and all these things started to kind of, like, all of a sudden wake up. Um, that but you were doing something, before I met you, you did a piece at the Walker. That was right at the same time. Oh, was at the same time, I and these are the And these are, these are part of the, the happy parts of my life. When my mother passed away, um, I received an email from Adrian Piper saying, I will meet you. <laughs> uh, and, and then we started this conversation for a piece that I did at the Walker. And, and, the, and that was the same year that you arrived too. And so there, were, there was this kind of changeover in how I was beginning to think about what I could offer as a pianist. Uh, and so that's, that's where... Um, I started trying to question it. I mean, I have to say that the Village Vanguard is one of my favorite places to hear, hear your music. I love hearing Jason's group playing there. You should go um, next November, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, all right, yeah, maybe. Should we show something? Yes. What is it? Oh. oh there you go. Just, I think, show the, um, don't you think, the snake dance? Like sure, yeah. The snake dance. We'll just show you a little section from what we did at Dia Beacon, 
and then we'll go on. Serpent has weathered the attack. I'm going to stop it because um, we don't have much time. But one thing I've noticed about this is the sound of the space is later uh, pieces will sound very different from that. Mm. The sound of the space is very loud in this recording. But so. <laughs> well, you can't do that. Okay. <laughs> I kind of wanted to see this again. Um, so this is a. <laughs> this is our, the first time we were, we were working together. This is the shape. And um, oh, okay, so maybe David, maybe can you play reanimation from the songs that I gave you? And there was a thing that Joan, I think, from this performance, then there was something that started to show up that that um, I had to manage mechanically in my technique that then continues to filter over in other pieces. So that snake dance piece then informs this piece uh, for another piece we do together called Reanimation. And this is one of the themes from Reanimation. So I think Joan wants to write. Well, um, I'll just have to say this is one of my favorite pieces. And so we use it in every piece now. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this just makes me want to get up and move around and do things. So um, David, can you play it from reanimation, that section? So this is just the way it was in the performance.
wait to see what he does in the performance. <laughs> no, I like, that's what we do, because we do these performances over and over again. And uh, Jason being, in, we can talk about improvisation. Um, I always think that's a confusing, a, a term that has many meanings. Mm -hmm. And um, so Jason improvises with a little bit mm -hmm. in, in the performances. It's always the same tune, always the same, you know, timing and everything, but there, you heard what he did in this compared to what you heard on the, um, the, recording. the recording. Right. And I think, um, and because the way, the way jazz traditionally has been structured for, let's say, the past hundred years is there's a theme and then there's variations on the theme. And that's what the variations are what musicians become famous is they show you how they could vary the theme and then all of a sudden everybody wanted to buy their records. It's what Miles Davis does, it's what John Coltrane does, it's what Ella Fitzgerald, it's what Billie Holiday does. They show you the variation. And sometimes they show you the variation so much that you forgot what the, the starting point was, you know? And, and, and so that's part of kind of like how we work, you know? And, and we also stake so much claim on the variation too. We stake so much claim on the, what is in jazz called the solo. We put everything into learning the solo. And then I think by the time it had gotten to my generation, we had forgotten why the solo was important. <laughs> you know, like, like what, what, what was the part of jazz as African-American music that demanded that there be a solo where a musician could say what they needed to say in the form every time they played the song. Like that, that was an inherent part of, of kind of say truth telling in code that would happen on stages for generations and generations. And so by the time it reaches the conservatory level where I kind of was studying Manhattan School of Music, no one was saying to you, that's your right and that's your freedom that many people died for, for you to take that solo. They never really said it like that, but that's how I understood it. Um, but it took me a long time to hear someone say it to me in that way to maybe understand what the solo was. So by the time Joan and I started to work together, what I understood that would be my new challenge was to then make themes, themes that could work in many ways, themes that could recur, which I hadn't traditionally thought of in a jazz setting, which is you play a song, then you play another song, and you play another song, but they might not necessarily relate to each other except that you're playing it. But then how could you use thing, themes that would jump back in time. Um, and so every piece we do, I try to develop these themes that sometimes, you know, depending on the image, would kind of return in a way that to make, kind of, to tie everything together. And there was something also about, like, trying to follow how you, you work is also the challenge that I think music is able to kind of be the tape or be the seam that kind of, like, can hold some of these disparate images, texts, sounds or ideas together, you know? Yeah, the way we work is actually, um, well, I develop the piece, and then I meet with Jason and show him the videos, and or the reading any kind of words. And Jason, um, we, we work in very primitive conditions. Jason brings his keyboard to a tiny little room where there's a projection, and then plays different things. He brings different examples. And so I say yes or no, and, and we find, it. It's, I mean, you're amazingly fast. Jason can put together a piece so fast. But for me, the soundtrack does, once the soundtrack is down, it pulls the whole thing together, actually. And she glossed over that part where there's a yes or no process. There's a lot of no. <laughs> and then there's an occasional yes, and you're like, finally, OK. So this one kind of gets put into the pile where we keep, and I can come back to these. And we record these long rehearsals. And, you know, and then we try to digest the sounds and then she might say, you know, there was this thing you played, like, do you remember that? Or I'll ask David, did you record that? And we'll look for this one little sound because sometimes these moments of energy happen so fleeting and you hope that there's something that can capture it. And then it might be gone. You might not be able to ever grasp it again, you know. Um, but also the, these were not the normal conditions that I had learned to rehearse or create music in. And they became now their so seminal to how I work. Like they are like that I can't move forward without kind of going through some of these processes. Um, 
that have really helped, I think, uh, define the, the work that I've done for the past 10 years, you know. From let's even say like the work for shape, scent, and the feel of things, one of the themes that I created for the very end of the piece became the first, I scored the film Selma by Ava DuVernay. And the first cue in that is actually from Joan Jonas. I actually reworked the theme that from, from shape, scent, and feel of things. Um, do we have that? Do I have that? I don't know if I gave you that song. It's no, called Heap. Do we have that last scene from the shape? Oh yeah, then show that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's yeah, show that. Then. That's a nice moment. <clears throat> um, Larry was asking a question, which I think is probably a good one to try to answer, which is how, how do, I would ask it to you, because as you move forward through your processes in making a piece, how do you know when you reach the, the thing that can then, the, what we were calling the yes, like how do you know when you've reached a yes point in a piece, um, or you know, or a subject, or a video. I mean, it's. I, I thought he was asking in relation to how did I know that you were the one. Oh, no. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> no, it's. I, I really depend on my intuition, and um, I listen. Of course, in my lifetime, I've listened to music a lot, and so I have an intuitive sense of um, how long something should be and how um, musicians, composers work, and how music works in terms of measures and beat and rhythm. And so I can't really, I don't have a system. Mm. And um, it's, oh, this is long enough, okay. And this sounds right. Things like that. Right. Um, but we really do work also off of that, that moment of, which is how time feels. Um, in jazz, we talk about drummers, you know, like, what's your time feel? It's like a, that's a real, yeah, like, like what's your time feel? Like, that's great, I love like, that. Like, and, and different people's time, we call it, we, you place time in different parts of the beat. Mm -hmm. There are people whose time feel is on top of the beat, that means they're almost rushing into the next, you know, it's a little bit of a head. There are people who play in the middle of the beat, and there are people who play behind the beat, mm -hmm. right? And, but there's always this thing about time feel. And, and, in, and in performance, there's that too. And in reanimation, there's a lot of, Jason, you have to play the cue when you think it's the right time, you know. And there are about three moments where this, you really have to also have to be cognizant that sometimes Joan is performing in a mask, you know, in a, in a, in a cape uh, and can't really see much. And she's sweating, <laughs> and, you know, and she's, you know, and so I have to kind of like make sure she has energy to finish the piece. <laughs> so I have to. I mean, uh, like, oh my God, when is it going to be over? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, so that, 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 that happens. Um, and those are things I think we have to be conscious of because of we work with time, you know. Um, we have cues. We give each other cues. I mean, when I have a ma Jason gives me a cue when I have the mask, right. a musical cue. And then he follows my cues, my movement. When I step into this, 
you follow those cues, right? Right. Yeah. And then how do you make sound to make someone react, you know? Like I went to, a, I gave a talk at like a fifth grade and I noticed that, that the teacher for the music class would play like a triad and then all the students, you know, it was like, it's like, damn, music is powerful. You know, like you can really simple stuff, you know? And when I sat, and they asked me to play something, so when I sat down, I played the thing just to try to see if I could make the people, and they, all the kids stood right up. And I was like, okay, I was just playing with you all, but, but like there's some triggers that sound does that people cannot define what the triggers are. Like that's hopefully why you listen to a bunch of music. It's because there's certain parts of sound and there are certain tonal centers and there are certain rhythms that people cannot really put their words or their language around how it can manipulate an audience, you know? And, and the power within that, that is kind of uncontained in a bottle, you know? And, uh, and so some, and the images I think do this too. Um, and hearing someone recite a poem does this, you know? Um, it can really unlock things. You feel it in your body, you all know that. You feel it in your body. And once this um, teacher I had a long time ago um, was talking about somebody who was in a hospital and he went to visit them and he told them that they, they were in pain and suffering and he told them to sing, mm. you know, and singing, you, your body vibrates when you sing. I always love that story. Right. Of, and that's what chanting is too. Right. But I mean, when you hear music, like Jason's music, you know, well, that's what performance is. You go into another, um, another realm of, of uh, sensibility, right? Right. And you just are part of it. How did, you know, when you were making, like, say, that you, sometimes I see these pieces, these early video pieces you made downtown, like in the dead of night when nobody's down there. You know, how to, like, more of, like, in the same kind of intuition, which you know about sound, then how do you know, say, necessarily, like, oh, this is a place to set up the camera, and this is the place to move, you know? How do you have an, like, how do you feel that? How do I know that? I mean, yeah, I find you know interesting that? places, what, you yeah, know? Yeah. But I mean, you know, New York used to have, I call them holes in the city. New York used to have a lot of holes. There, I'm sure there's still holes, but holes are spaces that are not gentrified, actually, and not smoothed over by um, some developer, that, which has happened all over the place. So Jason's referring to one night we went down to, the, to Wall Street with uh, Pat Steer, a friend of mine, a painter, and with, I have these tin cones. We took my props down there, these big nine-foot cones, and there was a guy named Andy Mann with a camera, and the three of us went down there and just fooled around the street. You can't do that now. No police, came, nobody cared, except there was this very large man who joined us, actually. He had a crush on Pat, and he was chasing her around. So part of the action was her trying to get away from this man. <laughs> anyway, but that, um, I don't, I, I'd love to do those things. I mean, um, we have to find some holes in New York, actually. Yeah, but, but okay, well, let me ask just one, like, just like, simple question, which is how did you get the cones down there? I think we had a big car. Right. Yeah, we didn't drag them down. Right. Um, like yeah. those things are, they're big. They're, I mean, this, this is not like a pencil she's talking about. This is like, these things are, they're, they're. Well, they're nine feet tall and um, they're about like this. Yeah. And so, 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 I had so, the energy. There's then. so much wrong with doing that, you know? Um, I mean, you know, I'm, just, I'm very conservative, you know. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, when I play and shit, like, I, I still, like, know that there's a line and I'm like, you know, I, I, I know where I can cross the line. Right, and in music, you you feel like you do that when you you know you, the instrument is your bound, right? But I also know that there are a bunch of lines I'm not crossing, and when when you're learning music to be, and especially in a place like conservatory or probably here to, at an art school, is you learn how to work, you learn how to make stuff that works, you know, and then you get into this process of working for work, you know. And so I, have, I teach musicians up at Boston New England Conservatory, and most of them are concerned with how to get good enough to work. And you know, it's interesting, because I remember when I learned that it was work, you know? <laughs> there is work. I mean, you do your art, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's work. There's a work part. Yeah. There's a work part that yeah. kicks in. And, and then wondering, okay, so then, because that is such an action, and I'm trying to, as you were telling the story, I was trying to think, like, where was 
the moment when I may have crossed the line. And it made me think of, this is during a performance, I was still in college and then we were playing and it was a slow ballad, right? Really quiet, you're supposed to be romantic, playing this song, playing this song, right? There's a table of people, mostly quiet audience, table of people really having a good time, talking with each other, laughing really loud. So I pause during the solo and, you know, try to collect myself. Um, they get louder, right? It doesn't seem to do anything. So I start playing again, and then I say, you know, well, this is a moment where I could break that wall between these little musicians and this audience. And I just stood up and said, will you calm the fuck down, shit? I yelled it at the top of my lungs to, to, to this table. And they stopped talking. <laughs> and I sat back down and I tried to get back into my romantic mood. <laughs> But there was a thing that there was like a, and, and all of my friends all of a sudden understood me in a very different way from that day going forward. Uh, as a player, not, you know, and as a friend, that I would stand up for their music the, in a way that they should. Um, and, there, and there are things that happen kind of like on a, in, in clubs that musicians have to manage. Um, but I think when I hear that story, it really kind of talks about, I, I, well, there is no boundary, you know, like, he's like, oh, no, this is the thing that we should do. We should just go do this. And I, one of my criteria is, is to be scared. Right. You know, if I'm, I used to teach, and one of my assignments is, what are you afraid of? And you shouldn't do everything you're afraid of doing, obviously, because some things are dangerous. Yeah. But sometimes when I'm really scared of doing something, that's a signal. Right, right. Uh, maybe we'll open the, the questions this moment, right? Hey, how you doing today? Great. Great conversation. I really enjoyed it, especially talking about jazz. Um, jazz has always been known to be a, a great influence on abstract expressionism, and to see it being used in um, performance art is uh, refreshing um, to bring something like that to this um, to this place, contemporary. I, I would like to know what are your um, jazz influences, because there's a few who I believe that you're thinking about when you're playing, but I would want to know if you know I can confirm some of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, I could give you the, I give you a couple of overground. I give you and both of you. Yeah, answer yeah. the question. That's a good question. Actually, you should ask Joan who her jazz influences are, and me who <laughs> my performance art influences are. Um, but I say my biggest one is Thelonious Monk. There's a beautiful man named Thelonious Monk who would have been a hundred years old in October, and he's. Um, He's a pivot point for modern music, period. Um, he somehow was tying things together and then totally exploding them and just working with small pieces at a time. Not only was it harmony or phrases or melodies, it was just, he just found the right nuggets to work with and he just reworked them over and over again. And as a pianist, he, that seemed to be such an inclusive practice you know, to have one that dealt with a small amount of, or shared such a small amount of knowledge rather than a vast amount. Duke Ellington, on the other hand, does a totally different thing. Like he's so expansive, you know, not only with music and sound and scope and sweep, but also with, you know, set design and costume and, you know, <clears throat> and general affability. They're kind of, you know, of the same tribe, but, but tribes in the same village, but, two different types of chiefs. Um, and those are two people that, I, that have really, they can, they can take as much investigation for centuries to come because they are that interesting as sound makers, Thelonious Monk and Duke Ellington. What about Oh yeah, well he's a homeboy for a long time ago. So, so there's, a, there's a whole crew of people who are, who are living Pianists, let's say Vijay is one, and Craig Taborn is another, and there's a woman named Chris Davis who is probably playing more piano than all of us put together. <laughs> Chris Davis. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, that's a very kind of like getting into a, a sharing um, 
but they do they do things that I that I'm perplexed by and in this way you know like you know the thing that I probably might say considering your statement about like are you scared which was I think my mother was so scared of me wanting to be a musician she would say oh you need to go ask that musician what school they went to because they're working you know <laughs> and she would be mad at me if I didn't ask like oh what's, my mom wants me to know what school you went to <laughs> You know, and uh, so just the fact of wanting to be a jazz musician was the most freaky thing, you know, because who said you're supposed to sign up to do that, you know? Um, who want to live that kind of lifestyle uh, that I'm sure many of you are questioning. If you're not, you should be. Um, like, is it like, and I think that there's a thing that you say in this story of going down to Wall Street, which is like, <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm here making this no matter what. Yeah. And that is the that for me is like when you tell that story, like that is like the biggest charge to like, oh well, you know, I mean I had many teachers who said you should not do this, you'll make only twenty dollars. I had teachers who Oh my god. Awful teachers. I'm sure I know you had it. <laughs> yeah, I had it. So who were your um, jazz influences? Man? Well, I don't, I don't know if they're influences, but I grew up hearing Dixieland. I mean, you know, I was born in 1936, so I grew up hearing Dixieland all the time, and my stepfather was, I hate to say it, he was a jazz musician. <laughs> <laughs> but he was kind of a, a drunk one. <laughs> and, um, anyway, but so I heard Dixieland all my, you know, ch in my late childhood. And then um, I'll just say about working with... Jason, uh, I always was interested in making sounds myself in my piece and doing my own soundtracks and so on. And um, but with Jason, he encouraged because he's a jazz musician. I think you encourage me to make sounds that when we do the duet, we do a duet together in almost every piece because I want to do it, you know. And and um, I have my little objects and bells and things like that. And Jason um, has encouraged me. Uh, to do this duet with him, and he, we work together. So that, for me, is, I think it's because no other musician asked me to do it in quite the same way. I think that's what jazz has brought. You know what I mean? Right, because there was something about when Joan would show up, and I mean, I mean, I could say that, like, this table and the things that are on this table right now, she'd be like, yeah, this is, this, these are the instruments I brought Jason, so what do you think about these? And I was like, really? You know, she's like, yeah, you know. But it'd be like an old car, you know, it'd be like a grader from 1952, you know, and, and like a, you know, like a colander, like a metal, co like, and then like marbles, and, and then she'd start, and I'd be like, I'd be damned, you know. Um, but, but you encourage me. But, but she's really good, too. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I think some of our early conversations, which were about, like, how, you know, because the first thing she did was, she said, okay, so you, we're going to do this piece, so I'm going to send you this anthology of folk music and blues music. And sent me, like, six CDs of music to be like, okay, so digest all of that. And then we'll meet in a month. And, you know, and then we'll start working, which was, like... <laughs> Like, that's a master class, like, you know, to say, okay, so this is where we're going to start from. Yeah, um, folk music was a huge um, love of my life, you know, as far as music go, all kinds of folk music from all different cultures. So I wanted to bring Jason into my world in that way. Mm -hmm. So that's what... And, that, and, and so that kind of thing was a th not necessarily a thing that any of my conservatory teachers were ever going to do. Yeah. They weren't going to say, you need to listen to all this folk music. Meanwhile, all that's happened at the same time as Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and Robert John. So wait a minute, all that music is actually related to one another. But they weren't even showing us that, you know? And it was such a disservice, you know? Once I, and then I realized, okay, so this was, I didn't get a master's. So, but my master's was like working with really great musicians and thinkers, you know? And, and Joan was like, okay, so here's this class. We're gonna have to really think about these folk songs, you know? And I would end up reworking some of the folk songs for some of these pieces constantly, whether it's folk songs from America or folk songs up in Cape Breton where she goes every summer in Canada, and really considering, like, what are they as sound and then how would I manipulate them? Yeah. He puts the sound, like you recorded some of the fiddle music and put it into the piece, the last piece. Right. That was a beautiful section. Yeah. Hi. Oh. 
This is a performance already. Hi. I was just wondering, because Jason talked about how he had to control an audience, and you talked about how you had to control your own audience, an audience of one, but you ended up incorporating that person into your work. So I wonder if the two of you could talk about um, how you've had to manage the reaction of your audience, how they react to the piece, anything that's unforeseen, which I think happens a lot in performance art, and um, if that becomes part of the work, or is that something that you edit out? Could you talk about that a little bit? I'll just say briefly that um, for me, the audience is, is, a, is a, an entity that I respond to. I can feel how the audience is responding and if they're concentrating and if they're you know, absorbed. I can feel if they are not. And in my long career, I've done some bad performances and that's the very worst experience, some, you know, the, your nightmare situation. Um, and so I don't try to control the audience, but what I do try to do is make what I call a good piece. You know, that's the only thing I can do. And to, it's about attention getting. That's what somebody said to me a long time ago, that my work was about attention getting. So I make images. I try to draw the audience into my world. So the beginning of my piece is always kind of like a bringing the audience into the mood of it. You know, we slowly work into it. And then they, they end, they're in part of it. So the audience is psychically part of the piece. So I don't, you know, I, I also don't, I, I rehearse very, very carefully and I do the same, pretty much the same thing, although I might add little tiny things. But basically, I don't improvise on the stage the way Jason does in the same way. I do the same thing, right, pretty much, pretty much. And um, I don't know if that answers your question. But so I don't, Sometimes new things come up during a performance and I keep it, but it's never, I don't, I do depend, sometimes I do a performance for my friends when I'm trying something out because I want their reactions, I do that. But I don't do that by the time I get to a, a more formal situation. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. No, not to me. <laughs> it's n it hasn't never happened to me. <laughs> not yet. Yeah, not yet. It's coming. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I always love, you know, once you work on a, anything and then once you present it to a group of people in a room, then anything is possible that can happen. Um, and you And the performer or whoever can really determine how much they want to necessarily take away from the performance by what they gauge from the audience. There's a thing in jazz called playing house, which is, is deeper than what, even what I'm saying. But, but there's, the, you know, there's cats that go for house. They call it going for house. They ain't going to really play nothing, but they'll play something to, to rile up the crowd, right? And the crowd will be like, oh, they held a note for 40 seconds, and, and we went crazy. <laughs> like that cat's playing, playing for house, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a real danger in the work that I've seen that plays for the house. I never really see it become anything other than playing for the house. And, and what I've tried to understand from the musicians and mentors that I've had, that, that almost you have to really be careful about how much you allow an audience in because it could actually start to break all of the the, the things you've tried to build up. So how will I understand how far I could possibly go if I always gauge what an audience responds to? And even when they like it, is that right? Did I want them to like it? Say for instance, I was playing this song called Nobody by Burt Williams, who's kind of a very prominent uh, uh, minstrel performer, black man dressed you know, in black face. And he made these song, this song called Nobody. And he talked about how nobody did nothing for him. In like 1906, he made this song, right? And so I w was playing this song. And, and I play it like <clears throat> this song is not the best song to play. So I play it as dirty as I possibly can. The band does too. But audiences was like, ooh, I love that minstrel song. 
So like, but there was, some, and I wouldn't even say that it was that kind of song, but I was like, oh man, you know, like, like, like there's codes in the songs. And, and even though I try to change the code, it still comes out. And, and, and so when I'm working with an audience, I'm working on not how they respond, but how do they listen? How silent can they get? Like I played in Tompkins Square Park over the summer of the Charlie Parker Jazz Festival. Tompkins Square Park still got some real New York in it. <laughs> and, and playing in the daytime in Tompkins Square Park is a challenge in the summer. So we played and then maybe that we started, people were yelling at each other, curse word, curse word. These are the audience members. Set that fuck down, you know, all this kind of. 10 minutes in, dead silent for the rest of the performance. Like, dead, like I couldn't hear anything, and we're in the middle of New York City in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, I gauge it only on how do they listen, rather than, oh, I jumped to my feet, you know. I, that, people do that just because it's the end of performance. We clap, we stand up. That's kind of like, we, that's just part of what we do. But I want to hear how quiet can it get. When we're doing these performances like in Venice or here in the kitchen or wherever, like it's like, like when, when, when will I feel the tension in the room because of what people are watching on stage? You know? I just want to say briefly that um, there's another whole thing called audience participation. And a lot of many performance artists do pieces based on audience participation. I don't. It's just not my nature. But I will say that um, in relation to the audience, I just did a kind of performance lecture in Kochi, India. It was part of something called Oceans as part of the Biennale. Anyway, it was in a, in a square called the Vasco de Gama Square in Kochi, which was a dirt square right on the edge of the fishing boat, where the fishing boats were right there. And there were, you know, there were vendors, and it was a very wonderful little space, not very big. And I was thrilled to do the performance there because otherwise if it had rained, we would have had to do it in a, in a, uh, a, a place with a fence around it that the people in the town couldn't go to. But the people in Kochi were stand, there were, there were kind of those barriers around the audience that was sitting in chairs, but the people in the square were leaning on the barriers and watching. And afterwards, one of the technicians came up to me and said he was so happy that, um, that they could look at it, these people from the town of Kochi, and I was really thrilled to do it there. Cause I was so happy I didn't have to do it in this colonial walled, you know, garden, and I could do it in the, in the, in the village square. So one has, you know, there are special audiences. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I, I experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, my question is to Joan. Um, um, you spoke about movement and about time and space and about rhythm, and I'm curious, my question is about your drawings and the way, in a way, he spoke also about the way that um, an image, a, 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 a piece could be done many times in different way of expression, or something, mm -hmm. not quoting you, but it's something similar to that. And I was um, interested on you drawing many images in that way repeatedly, mm -hmm. and if you can talk about the relation to drawing, maybe like jazz or, I don't know, what do you think about it? Um. Well, I, I, I try, in each one of my works over the years since I began, I try to think of a different way of making a drawing. I mean, it's not always very different, but um, and the, the way of making the drawing is either the, the technique, am I going to use ink or chalk, um, the size, the scale, is it going to be just for the video camera, is it going to be a huge drawing on the floor that the whole audience can see, um, or is it going to be a small drawing that they see through the monitor. Or um, is it something to do with the subject matter? In, in reanimation, um, the birds were the subject matter, and fish are, are another part of the subject matter. And then the next thing is um, I've drawn in relation to sound. And the sound, the music, inspires. The, mov the drawing is movement. And you move your body, or you, you move your arm, or you move your hand, but it's in relation to the sound. So when I'm drawing, I don't know if this is answering your question, but when I'm drawing the birds in relation to you know, that's what drives me. And I have to draw the birds as fast as possible. So that makes them look a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it affects the way the drawing looks. Mm -hmm. And that's what interests me about doing a drawing in a performance, is that you don't really, it's, it's again, a process in which something else is going to happen.
Hi. I'm curious about the notion of how the idea of ecology might play into both of your works. Like earlier, Jason, you were talking about like the way that working with Joan was making you think of the environment and like the site specificity of your work. And obviously like the overt idea of ecology is important to your recent work, Joan, but also you're also talking about environmental factors affecting and in a way you're both creating environments that the other person is responding to. So I was wondering if you could talk about the mutuality of the, that relationship and the idea of ecology. Well, it's a definite part, of, it's a subject for me, uh, but I wouldn't, I didn't call it ecology, I called it. Um, when I started working on reanimation, it was based on an Icelandic novel. When I began to focus on this subject um, called uh, Under the Glacier, and I started working on the idea of glaciers, and then you think, what is the present situation? So glaciers are melting. And that's how I began in this period of my life to get into uh, questions of the climate, the globe, and then what's happening to animals and, and so on. And I don't know if that answers your question. It's a very general answer. I, I guess it's like the, but it's like the, that interest in the environment comes from longer, you know, to the whole, goes back to like working in the holes, you know, in a different way. Well, it's working um, outdoors. A lot of my work happens outdoors. And um, I wouldn't say that would be eco ecology, but I think for Jason, he was talking about space. If you make sound, the sound is affected by the space. So if you make sound outdoors, you know. Right. And, th and it was also, there was something that I hadn't thought about, which really great musicians like Charlie Parker or Duke Ellington did in the similar way that Joan does, which is this way, this way of recycling images, too. Um, a way of reframing an image you already have made, you know, recutting it, replacing it uh, in some work that would be later, you know, and that I would then start to try to re reimagine some of the themes that I had written some years ago and make successive works based on one theme. Um, but then the, the part about, let's say, environment might be part of, and I might even say what, what was the, I was really concerned about the stereotypical jazz environment as a whole. So much so that, um, th that I just started trying to recreate environments that didn't exist anymore. Um, so the Village Vanguard is a club that still exists, but a club that was in Harlem called the Savoy Ballroom does not exist anymore. So for New York to get rid of kind of jazz environments for me is a tragedy. It's a small one, but it's a tragedy for me. Um, and so then how do I try to consider how it feels to play in, say, an old space and then try to consider to say, if I, re if I make the space now, if I build it, then how will it feel to sit inside this space and play? And so I started trying to make works that were addressing that very subject and still do. Um, and even, you know, and, and to even consider that the, I think what Joan, what was special about seeing the work for the first time, which was, was like she said, she works outside and so much of, nearly all of my work is inside. All of my work is in a small room, you know, uh, practicing in small rooms with small piano all the time. And here's this woman, you know, in, on her land, you know, with her dog. He's know. been to visit me in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, so that there was all this part of the world that was not in the jazz world, which is most of the world. You know, like, there was, there was so much but, more to consider. You, I mean, you're the people who you speak of as influences and indirectly. They played outdoors. They do. Yeah. And, we, and, and, and most of the concern for us is people. Like, we really are concerned as musicians about people. Really concerned about how people deal with one another and how the, work, the music works. We, we really consider it all the time, you know. And it's very personal when musicians get together to share sound. So, mm -hmm. Once we got into a space where then we're going to share all of this stuff together for years and years and years, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but also it was a thing that I thought would unlock maybe other people so that I would have all of my jazz musician friends know that Joan Jonas is a major part of my life. It was very important for me.
wow. to have that be <laughs> talked about. To have them know her name like they would know John Coltrane's name. Now nah, you need to know Joan Jonas. Actually, she's here in the club tonight. You need to say her name, and everybody needs to stand up and applaud her. Like, you know, like, I wanted that. Like, those, Adrian Piper means that much to my thinking as a jazz musician, as much as Thelonious Monk, as much as Thelonious Monk. And that, and that that part is a part of, would be a part of how I would change my direction as a musician. Well, I would say um, Jason's generosity is an amazing, amazing thing to run into it in my, late in my life. It really um, is so important, and he's such a generous person. But he's talk, speaking of it in a way that explains his generosity um, through the music. And music is generous, and it's the one form that it exists in the airwaves. It's, it, it, it can go across space through the radio, through... And um, when you think about how different cultures relate to each other, there's never a question if music crosses over. I mean, with the visual arts, it's always a question, you know, am I using this in an in inappropriate way? But music, I don't think that comes up. I think people share music much more. Do, do you think so? It's a thing that, a, ha that can happen very quickly without any preparation. Yeah. And, that, and that's, the, that's the big one. Um, we have a lot of students, young artists, emerging artists in the room. Um, we're talking about collaboration. I guess you talked about being scared. And you talked about work. Is there, you know, last statements? I guess one piece of advice you would give the young mm -hmm. artists here. My advice is to work hard <laughs> and to love what you do because you may not be recognized for a while. It's very important to love it. And to find small groups of like-minded or not like-minded, but don't worry about the big picture. Worry about your immediate circle, and then it will expand. That's ditto. I was going to say this. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>